This is the After Party, live with Kim McAllister. Pick a couch, grab a drink, and settle into the conversation. And good Monday morning to you. Good afternoon. Good Monday afternoon, I should say. I'm Kim McAllister. You've got it on the After Party Live. Good Mark Thompson show. Good guests today. Of course, the March Mark's Madness is barreling toward the end. We'll see which which uh, drop wins. It's kind of fun to play along. Hope you've been doing that. Great Nikki Maduro show today, too. If there's anything on those shows that you want to talk about, happy to entertain the subject. I have a lot of interesting stories for you today, though. Um, a lot of sciencey stuff, some animal stuff as well. I have a one about what exactly makes teenagers stink the way they do. So we'll, hopefully we'll get to that story and talk about that as well. <clears throat> uh, welcome, everybody. I have to say, I think it's Mindy's birthday. Am I right? Happy birthday to you, Mindy. And thank you for hanging out with us on your birthday. Here's some balloons for you. Oh, you know what? You can't see the balloons because I'm big and there's no way to make me little. So I'm so sorry about that. Just know I'm trying to give you balloons, but happy birthday to Mindy and thanks for being here. Uh, Love it when you guys spend your time with us like this or with, with us collectively. It's the collective us. Thank you, Wes, for the $5 super sticker swooping in to be the first and your contributions to the show are very appreciated. Luis throwing down a $5 as well. Get yourself a Powerball and Megatex. Oh, that's good. Luis, if I'm winning with your winnings, I'm definitely sharing with you. And we're doing a money giveaway on the show. Can you imagine if you won a $1.1 billion jackpot? Of course, then you have to cut it in half because then, you know, you only walk away with half of it. And then you have to lop off some for state taxes. But you'll still walk away with, you know, a couple hundred, few hundred million. So I'm willing to share. I think who needs that much money, right? This is when we all celebrate together. This is good stuff. That's why I'd be a horrible rich person, because I wouldn't hoard it. I'd be like, oh, I have all this money, and you get some, Oprah, and you get some, and you get some. Anyway, I always hope that somebody good and worthy who really needs the money wins, but I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, Yes, good. I'm glad I got it. Who wasn't supposed to tell me? Oh, as far as your birthday? Well, we always celebrate a birthday, right? So I like that you exist in the world and that you're out, you're here with us. So we have to celebrate that. Okay, let's get right to it because I can see you guys talking about the story. So I don't want to delay, especially since we're delayed by uh, the Mark Thompson show uh, ending a little bit late. But let's first do our animals and talk about these bears who went on a little adventure. Look at them on a swan boat. Yeah, I mean, why not? They took a cruise on a swan boat. This happened at a British safari park. And they used their recent rains to give their North American black bears a little ride on the swan boat. This happened at the Woburn Safari Park in Ridgemont, England. The heavy rains caused a lake to form at the bottom of the 13-acre enclosure where 11 bears live. And so the zookeepers brought in this swan boat a pedal-powered swan boat. They put it in the water. They put some honey and some monkey nuts inside to encourage these bears to check out the boat. And they did. And so the safari park then showed uh, photos and a video to social media, uh, folks that follow them, of these bears investigating the swan boat. And it looks pretty cute. Like they're a little family out for a swan boat excursion, right? The keepers and the visitors delighted when the bears climbed into the boat to reach for the food. Uh, The the safari park said they could be spotted climbing all over, playing with and sniffing the boat with great curiosity. It made for a great picture. I'll say that, at least. Um, No, I'm not being nasty. I will say this. Have you heard of a Japanese tit? It's a bird, okay? It's a bird. Before you you get all aggro, this is a bird. And it has some interesting behavior. By fluttering its wings, the Japanese tit will tell its mate, no, after you, right? Yeah, it's kind of sweet. Uh, they, you know, a lot of species have these, I don't want to say, 
you know, gestures that we do, human beings sometimes will raise an eyebrow to have, you know, to communicate something that we're thinking. Uh, This particular bird, the Japanese tit, uh, flutters its wings in order to communicate. So uh, it's an interesting study of of this and an interesting phenomena. And it's the first time that scientists have really observed a bird communicating by flapping its wings. It's a, they say it's a polite little bird because it's saying, no, after you, you go first. The discovery significant because using gestures for communications has only been seen in great apes and humans. This study done uh, and published in the Colonel Current Biology So the birds were observed arriving at a nest box with food in pairs. And as they waited on the perches outside, one would flutter its wings to the other one. And it was interpreted by researchers as indicating to the other bird, no, please, you go first after you. The Japanese tit using gestures to communicate with their mate. The associate professor doing the study from the University of Tokyo said for 17 years, he's been engaged in the study of these birds. They not only use specific calls to convey particular meanings, but they combine different calls into phrases using synactic rules. Diverse vocalizations led the professor to initiate the research on physical gestures as well. They observed more than 320 nests across eight matching pairs of Japanese tits where the parents would enter the nest box one at a time when they were carrying food back to their chicks. And they saw that the birds would often find a nearby perch and flutter their wings at each other before entering, prompting the mate to enter the box first, with the one who fluttered entering second. They also saw the gesture was performed more often by the female of the pair. And they were surprised, they say, to note that the results were a lot clearer than they'd expected them to be. They think it fulfills the criteria to be a true symbolic gesture. Only, again, something previously observed in apes, including chimpanzees, bonobos, of course, us as well, right? The fluttering was aimed at the mate, not the box itself. It wasn't a pointing gesture. It was a different type of gesture. So, yeah, very interesting. They think that this whole making gestures like this that indicate communication um, is a thought to need complex cognition. And that hasn't been seen in very many species except humans. So it advances our understanding of visual communications in birds. It's a hypothesis that walking on two legs allowed humans to maintain an upright posture, uh, freeing up their hands for greater mobility, which in turn contributed to the evolution of gestures. So who knows? Maybe these birds are in the middle of an evolution. I thought that was an interesting one. Um, How about... I'm talking about animals. I'm sorry to show you the picture because uh, I hate seeing bugs up close. It's a daddy long legs. Apparently, this species of daddy long legs look like they have two eyes. That does not count the hidden eyes that they have. The other eyes never fully develop. Yeah. They also note that this lineage of the daddy long legs has been around a lot longer than they thought, about 50 million years older than previously thought. They've done a daddy long legs research paper published in Current Biology talking about four extra hidden eyes that they didn't know about and how much longer these daddy long legs have existed than we thought. That's all I can take because I don't want to look at that picture any more than I absolutely have to. So let's move to Stumpy. Stumpy is beloved. See people hugging this tree? Goodbye to Stumpy. Stumpy's out of there, along with a lot of other trees as well. Stumpy is this Japanese cherry blossom that's kind of gotten scragglier and scragglier. He's like the Charlie Brown cherry blossom tree. But even though he's scraggly, every spring, Stumpy blooms. And people flock to Stumpy and get their picture taken with Stumpy because they all know about Stumpy. 
but Stumpy's on his last legs. The arborists in Washington, D.C. say his interior trunk is now hollow. And so Stumpy joins about 158 trees scheduled to be cut down in the next few months as part of a $113 million seawall repair project right near the National Mall. And they say this is because of climate change. So the National Park Service is pulling ultimately 300 of the 3,700 trees that line the banks of the Tidal Basin Reservoir. This is right between the Thomas Jefferson and Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorials. They're trying to shore up the seawalls lining the reservoir and the West Potomac River. Stumpy has been high profile since about 2020 during the pandemic when uh, somebody posted a picture of Stumpy on Reddit and they said, look at the limp condition of the tree. It's like the limp condition of my love life. And ever since then, people have tried to take, get their picture taken with Stumpy. But if you don't do it in the next, you know, I don't know how long, few weeks, Stumpy's out of there. So goodbye to Stumpy. This person, I don't know who would think of doing such a thing. This guy, a Florida man has been ordered by a court now to remove a shipping container boat that he's been using as a house from a lagoon. And it's not the first time that this person has been asked to get rid of the shipping container from a smaller waterway that really just can't handle the size of it. Fane Lozman is his name, and there's a lawsuit saying that he violated the Rivers and Harbors Act by placing a structure made from a modified shipping container and floating docks into navigable waters without authorization. And that is a violation of law, according to the lawsuit, because they, it can pose a risk of harm to others. Um, and it's just, I mean, it, it also damages the the docks in the area and the ecosystem there. So he, he's been moving this thing around from lake to lake. I don't know how you transport it, maybe by big rig. But he's been moving it to different areas in Lake Worth Lagoon in Palm Beach and Palm Beach County. On a couple of different occasions, the docks have become unmoored. One dock split away from the structure. One uh, one time, the dock holding the shipping container, which he's modified to include furnishings and windows and doors and stairs and even a rooftop deck, floated across the lagoon and beached at a public park. So not safe, right? Since the lawsuit, he's removed several pieces of the structure from the lagoon, but two floating docks and the modified shipping container are still there. He was in trouble for this in 2009, and that time, the city of Riviera Beach confiscated his floating house uh, from the marina on grounds that it was illegally docked. And now here we have another one. The city bought it at auction for less than a third of its value and then destroyed it. But that didn't stop him because now here he is again. Uh, now he's been ordered to remove a shipping container from this lagoon. I don't know what you th you think. You could just dump your giant thing in there for free and it's going to be okay? No, I don't think so. Nope. I've often thought about this when I've seen these people in the doing the hard work on power lines or up on tr in trees and how high they have to go up in this bucket. Uh, it happened to this guy. Uh, this guy got stuck in the bucket. Yeah. 30 feet up in the air and the bucket stops working. A bucket truck just malfunctioned. It also happened in Florida where firefighters had to come to the rescue of this tree trimmer because of this malfunctioning bucket truck. 30 feet over the air. <laughs> he had to stay there for a while too. This happened in St. Lucie County in Florida. Last Thursday, a call came in about 2 p.m., that this tree trimmer is stranded in a bucket way up high. He'd been trimming branches when the lift malfunctioned and he got stuck in place. So they ha brought in a second bucket truck to reach him. So he has to climb from one bucket into the other bucket, which had to be a little risky. And then they brought him safely back to the ground. So he's okay. Everything's all right. But it was a few tense moments there for the bucket truck. Oh, this woman... Can you believe this lady is 40 years old, which doesn't seem very old, but in the world of skating, it's, you know, getting up there when you're competing with 
girls that are 14, 15, early 20s. This 40-year-old woman just became the oldest woman to win a world figure skating championship. And she did it in doubles, which is when she has to be tossed around, right, and do acrobatics in the air. Her name is Deanna Stellato Dudek. She retired in 2001, they say, before many of today's elite skaters were even born. But this week, she came out of retirement and along with her partner, Maxime Deschamps, to defeat athletes less than half their age. And she becomes the oldest woman to win a world figure skating championship in pairs. I'm telling you, lifted over the ice, thrown, right? Tossed more than 10 feet in the air while spinning. She's incredible. Stellato Dudek said she hopes the historic victory inspires everyone, even people who aren't skating, who might think it's too late to pursue and achieve their goals. Here's what she said. I hope it encourages people to not stop before they reach their potential. And I hope it transcends into other areas, not just sports, but other areas of life like work and professional careers. It's a sport full of dangerous skills, injuries. A lot of these skaters retire in their mid-20s, and that's what she did. She had a really cool junior career as a single skater. She won the 1999-2000 International Junior Grand Prix Final. She took silver at the 2000 World Junior Championships, but she had a lot of injuries. Broke her left ankle at one point, tore a ligament in her right ankle, a hip injury. So she retired at 17 years old in 2001. And for 16 years, she just lived a normal life. She was uh, became an esthetician. She got married. She wasn't really skating. But she said she always felt like she had some kind of unfinished business. She said, what if I quit it too early? What if I had more to accomplish and I wasn't done? So she put on her old skates and back onto the ice she went. So in her 30s, she goes back to skating, gets uh, into pairs skating, and returns, returns to competition. Big stamina to pull this off. I mean, this is very strenuous and dangerous, this type of sports. And you have to be really strong to do this. You have to be able to stabilize yourself in the air, um, be able to land, right, when you're thrown. You have to be pretty powerful. So... And there's a lot of risk. And of course, the older you are, you know, we don't bounce back from injuries as like we once did. But she said she called every single coach she ever met in her entire life to see if they had anyone available as a potential partner. And so it led her to Canada and to Champs, who is from Quebec, Quebec, uh, more than eight years younger than her. He also had a very successful junior career. And was open about his own challenges. I guess he has ADHD. Um, but they became partners. He, She's 40. He's 32. And she said, being the oldest championship in the world is not something I ever set out to do when I came back to skating. But she said, if I knew that if I were able to accomplish my dreams, it would inevitably occur because I'm the oldest everywhere. And being the oldest is fine with her. She said, I carry it with pride and I'm very proud of it. And I hope a lot of other athletes stay around a lot longer too. So pretty cool. I mean, way to go. I think when you feel like you still have something left, that you left too early, that you still have more to do, and you can do it, go get it. Way to go. And that goes for all of us. If there's something you always wanted, that's you can look at your life and go, I think I can still make that happen. Why not? Never too late to stop growing, stop learning, and stop hoping for things. This is a story we talked about recently, but I don't think we had this information. And so I wanted to make sure that we did because I think it's so interesting. And it's about the reason that we don't have tails. And apparently scientists have found that it all comes down to this one gene. And I don't think we talked about this before, but they've traced our tail loss to the short sequence of a genetic code abundant in our genome but dismissed for decades as junk DNA. 
They thought before that it served no biological purpose. It's called the ALU segment, ALU segment. And now we know, thanks to a scientist, that it's part of tail length genes. And there are genetic sequences capable of switching their location, jumping genes in the genome, or triggering or undoing mutations. And so the scientist looks at the section of gene that a lot of people have really ignored. And he starts thinking about it. And he realizes that it he thinks it has something to do with the tails. And so unfortunately, he did this study on mice and tampered with their this particular set of genes. And lo and behold, depending on what he did to it, the tail came out in the baby mice, either non-existent or super short or super long. So uh, he extrapolates that this is this ALU element abundant in, in human DNA. The insertion, he said, of something called TBXT is one of in out of a million that we have in our genome. He said, while most researchers dismissed it as junk DNA, he noticed its proximity to a neighboring ALU element and suspected that if they paired it up, it could trigger a process of disrupting protein production in the TBXT gene. And lo and behold, he was right. They used CRISPR gene editing technology to breed mice with this ALU insertion in their TBXT genes. And they found that the ALU made the TBXT produce two kinds of proteins. One led to shorter tails. If you had more of it, it led to a different kind of tail. So now we understand how they replicate in the genome. And he said, we're forced to think of how they're also shaping important aspects of physiology or morphology of development. One small little thing can lead to the loss of the whole appendage like a tail. Let's go to brown pandas. Brown pandas, they thought for a while, were kind of a, a genetic mutation of your regular panda, the black and white panda, right? Um, but now scientists are starting to understand a little bit more about why they're this color. They thought it was, um, they thought it was inbreeding in this area. This type of panda, the brown and white panda, live in this single mountain range in China. And because they're all from this one area, that's why researchers thought, oh, it must be inbreeding. But now they're looking deeper into the mystery of why they have these unusual coats. And they think it's the result of a natural variation rather than a sign of inbreeding in what is really a dwindling population. So the first brown panda was a female named Dan Dan. A ranger found her in this province in the Quinling Mountains in 1985 and kept her, they kept her in captivity until she died in 2000. Since then, in 1985, there have been 11 reported sightings of other brown and white pandas. The recurring instance of brown pandas imply this trait may be inheritable the genetic basis underlying brown and white remains unclear, though. Uh, they have a better understanding of the distinctive coloration, um, get, getting a better understanding, could help inform efforts to breed them in captivity. So now they think it's like, you know, do you have red hair or do you have blonde hair or do you have black hair or do you have brown hair? That it's just one of these things where it's, uh, a matter of genetics. They compared under a microscope hair samples from three black and whites. Uh, the brownish fur had fewer and smaller melanosomes, tiny structures and cells that are responsible for pigment in mammals. And they were more likely to be irregularly shaped as well if it, in the brown and white panda. So they've uncovered that it's genetic information they tested all the family members in the group 
and they say an individual genes can carry recessive traits like blue eyes or red hair without appearing as a physical characteristic. Each parent, they say now, has to possess a copy of the genetic variant and pass it on in order for the trait to appear as uh, in offspring in order to be a brown and white. So that's what it is. Now they know. The mystery is solved. Now to the top story of the day. It is the Neo plant. It's a plant that's really expensive, but apparently it's 30 times better than a regular house plant at kicking off oxygen. And so it's being called a little air scrubber. It's bioengineered to purify the air in your home. So maybe you have paint on the walls, smelly pieces of furniture that are new that are off gassing or whatever, household cleaning products. They wanted to target all of these things in homes by scrubbing the air. These plants are about $180 each and you have to pre-order them. You imagine killing a plant that was 180 bucks. You're like, no, <laughs> gotta take really good care of this one. Remember to water it. It's equivalent to up to 30 regular house plants in terms of air purification, according to the people responsible for making it. So, I mean, it, it's cool. If you had a few of those around, you'd have a healthy investment in plants, but maybe the air in your house would be better. I don't know. Something else that researchers have come up with, innovators have come up with, is this thing called the water cube. Hmm. The water cube from the Genesis systems is supposed to make fresh water by pulling it out of thin air. They do it by using this three-step filtration system process that is supposed to make this water pure, even pure enough to drink. The developers say it gives people the water freedom to be able to do what they want with water. It's a good way that we can be water stewards, putting water back or not taking from the aquifers. So when it's paired with solar, the system can run for 24 hours, make up to 100 gallons of water a day, but it's going to cost you. So if you're thinking, oh, this is a great way to save on the water belt. Yeah, the um, water cube costs 20 grand. But maybe this technology is what we'll have to do in the future to create water that isn't, I don't know, polluted, microplastic up. Although microplastics are probably floating in the air. But I thought that was interesting. Making water by pulling it right out of thin air. All right. <laughs> They're doing something in this town in California to try to protect the privacy of prisoners, right? In pictures that they're releasing, they're putting Lego heads on them. So pictures of people in the back of squad cars or being arrested. They post a Lego head over them in order to protect their privacy. Disguising suspects. But Lego is saying, wait a minute, you can't do this. We don't want our Lego heads to be associated with crime. So Lego is asking the Murrieta Police Department to stop using various images, including emoji faces and characters from the Grinch, Shrek, and Barbie to cover the faces of suspects in mugshots and other photos posted to social media. They've been doing this for a couple of years. I'm surprised it took Lego this long. This year, California adopted a statewide law prohibiting police from sharing uh, pictures of suspects in nonviolent crimes. And the Murrieta police says, well, we pride ourselves in being transparent with our community, but we also have to honor and protect everyone's rights, as is law now, even the rights of the suspects. So in order to share what's happening in Murrieta, we chose, they said, to cover the faces of suspects to protect their identity while still aligning with the new law. Well, wow. In recent weeks, the department has made a practice of using images depicting the heads of Lego mini figurines to block out the faces of suspects on social media. But now that's come to an end. 
The Lego group, they say, reached out to us and respectfully asked us to refrain from using their intellectual property on our social media content, which of course we understand and will comply with. We are currently exploring other methods of publishing our content in a way that's engaging and interesting to our followers. I mean, it was pretty creative. I'll give them that. So Murrieta Police stopping that whole process. The pictures were pretty funny, I have to say. Lego, they're not amused. No thank you. All right, let's talk about what makes teenagers stink. It turns out, as many people already suspected, it's all about hormones. Mm -hmm. It's certain chemicals in our body that give teens a pungent body odor. Carboxylic acids and steroids contribute to the fruity, musty, sandalwood-like scents. You know, puberty changes everything. You get taller, you get crankier, body odor becomes more pungent. And scientists say, the compounds that give teenagers their natural aroma are two smelly steroids and higher levels of carboxylic acids. This report um, published March 21st in the Communications in Chemistry. And that's what it says, that there is a reason that teenagers are smelly like this. So it's not their fault. We have to give them a break, right? This story... oh, Oh, talk about old brains. I always thought this was interesting because for a long time, people thought it was, you know, soft tissues that decay first. When you open up a grave or you find a body, it's always the bones left behind and all the soft tissue that's gone. Well, in this particular instance, researchers are saying they find a lot of brains that are really well preserved and it really defies the whole assumption of the soft tissue decay. It can be the human brain very resistant to the what they call the ravages of time. And they've done a study, the study people are at it, cataloging human brains that have been found on the archaeological record and around the world, and they discovered the brain resists decomposition far more than originally thought even when the rest of the body's soft tissues have completely melted away, the brain stays. So interesting. Uh, taphonomist, not taxonomist, taphonomist, T-A-P-H-O-N, uh, molecular taphonomist, Alexandra Morton Hayward with the University of Oxford, led a team of scientists identifying more than 4,400 preserved human brains dating as far back as 12,000 years ago. And the results are contradicting previous evidence that the human brain is among the first organs to decay after death. They said that's not true. That it represents an archive that we can use to better understand our own evolutionary history and the diseases that have affected us over time. In the forensic field, it's well known that the brain is one of the first organs to decompose after death. But after this huge archive Um, is studied, they say it demonstrates there are certain circumstances in which it can survive. Whether that's environmental, related to the brain's unique biochemistry, is the focus of this work. But the researchers say they're finding amazing numbers and types of ancient biomolecules preserved in these archaeological brains. And they say it's really exciting to explore all of this and what it says about life, what it says about our ancestors and our history. The archaeological preservation of soft tissues when a body is left to nature and not artificially pumped up full of preservatives, like embalming or freezing, is a pretty rare occurrence. Experimental decay studies have shown the brain is one of the first organs to succumb to decomposition. And so it was thought that the preservation of the human brain in a body where everything else but the bones decayed was a pretty rare phenomenon, an almost one-of-a-kind event. They wanted to know how rare is this really. So they went on this global search for preserved human brains. It sounds kind of creepy. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm on a hunt for preserved human brains that are really old and still intact. 
They looked through all the published scientific literature they could get their hands on. They reached out to historians around the world, and they documented 4,405 preserved human brains from 213 sources. Every continent in the world except Antarctica represented here. Records dating back to the middle of the 17th century. And the brains were from a variety of environments, too. Some from a mass grave from the Spanish Civil War that were preserved even with gunshot wounds and all kinds of stuff. More from the sandy deserts in ancient Egypt, victims of ritual sacrifice at a volcano. Uh, the Toland Man found in a peat bog and the bank of a lake in Stone Age Sweden. Anyway, they looked at all of these brains um, and the environmental conditions in which they were found. And it correlated with natural preservation. And that includes dehydration, freezing, tanning, like in peat bogs, saponification, which turns fat into wax light like molds. And something else stood out. Of the 4,405 brains, a high number of them, more than 1,300, about a third of the total, were the only soft tissue structure that survived in otherwise completely skeletonized remains. Isn't that interesting? And they were all among the oldest, too, with the ages as great as 12,000 years old. So why is that? The method couldn't be linked to natural preservation conditions because they were found in shallow mass graves, tombs, shipwrecks, burial mounds, even decapitated in some cases. And so the researchers say there might be a soft tissue preservation mechanism specific to the central nervous system. They're still trying to figure out what that is, but they think it might be an interaction between molecules in the brain and something in the environment. So like proteins, lipids, and sugars in the brain could fuse and form stable polymerized macromolecules. Now you're talking science. In the presence of certain metals like copper, abundant in the brain. But it's an interesting phenomenon, and it's still being studied. But they say it's the first step toward a systematic investigation into ancient brains beyond 12,000 years old before the present and essential to maximizing information uh, as this most metabolically active organ in the brain is among the most commonly preserved of soft tissues. So... I know, sorry, that was a little long, but I was kind of interested in that. I think it's so fascinating. Here's something a little wacky for you, a little less sciencey, a little less wacky. They held this race in France. Waiters and waitresses raced through the streets of Paris for the first time in 13 years, and they did it ahead of the Olympics. And is kind of exciting. <laughs> fun, something fun to do, right? You take the picture down because I have video to show you. They had a, a croissant and I think a cup of coffee or tea as they raced through the streets. Here's a little bit about, about how it looked or of how it looked, I should say. Here it is. Is that all ages too? Some are old, some are young, and they go on this race. Trays of food and drinks, mostly croissants you can see there. Cups of water, cups of coffee, cups of tea. Balancing. Uh, and the fastest, uh, fastest competitors from the cafes of Paris and bistros took the, to the starting line on Sunday. They've been doing this event for 110 years. It's been off, though, for the last 13. So, oh, he's going fast. Look at him. He's got good balance. They did it again this year to promote this summer's Olympics being held in Paris. They do it for one, uh, one and a quarter miles. And you have to balance your tray with your, your croissant and your drink on it through the streets of historic dis districts in a big loop, starting and finishing at the City Hall of Paris. About 200 people were involved. They were all dressed up in their waiter and waitress uniforms. They loaded up their trays with what they call a regulation pastry, but an empty coffee cup. And then they had also uh, a full glass of water as they did this and competed. 
At the end of the race, they were judged on how much liquid they spilled as well as their time. The winners, Pauline Van Wimmersearch and Sammy Lamru, crowned Paris's fastest waitress and waiter. He did it. Uh, she did it, rather, in 14 minutes and 12 seconds. She works at the Le Pie Pont Café and Restaurant facing the Notre Dame Cathedral. Anyway, kind of fun. She said she started wait uh, waitering, waitressing when she was 16. Now she's 34, and she can't envision any other life for herself. She said, I love it as much as I hate it. It's in my skin. I can't leave it. It's exhausting. It's demanding. It's 12 hours a day. It's no weekends. It's no Christmases. But I grew up in a way with a tray in my hand, and it's shaped my life and in the job by the bosses who trained me and the customers and all of the people that I have met. So, congratulations to her. That's pretty fast. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess you want to honor the wishes, wishes of the people that you love, the last wishes. But Disneyland is asking, please don't come and try to sprinkle your ashes here. And we've known that people have done this for a long time. Sometimes they try to do it covertly. Or maybe they think that in the middle of a dark ride that no one will notice. No. They have to shut the rides down when people dump cremated ashes. They say doing this is not going to work out how you want it to. And you're trying maybe to leave a little piece of the person that was your loved one at a place that they felt happy in and loved. But they say spreading ashes around at Disneyland does not end well for Disneyland, for other people at the park, for you, for your loved one. This story out of SF Gate, they say people do this a lot more than you'd think with horrifying results. So here's this post on X uh, from March 17th. Someone spread some ashes on the rise of the resistance at Disneyland last night. They say, don't do this, folks. They had to shut the ride down. Look at it. Like it's got all, you know, squished across all the, the flooring and the tracks were going over it. Yeah, scattered on the floor of Star Wars Rise of the Resistance, ride cars have clearly gone through the substance, sweeping it all over the floor, leaving tracks. They say it's not clear whether they were actual human remains. I Disneyland wouldn't comment on it. But it's a persistent issue at Disneyland where people do bring human remains to do this. If they see you doing it, you'll be removed from the park, possibly banned for life. So there goes the end of your whole Disneyland love. Thousands of angry park guests probably taking out their frustrations on you. Um, they can't, they have to close down the ride and clean it. So a lot of people won't have access to it then. Because human remains are con considered a biohazard. And so you have to clean it up differently. It's not like a, you know, an orange juice spill, right? You have to clean and you have to sanitize and you have to do all these things. It, they have to bring out special equipment. They have to close rides down for extended periods. And they say it's really not the way you want a loved one's ashes treated. So they call it a HEPA cleanup. I can understand people wanting to do this, but really, come on. No, it's just, you know, they, they're just going to sweep it up and put it in bags. And I don't, it's not going to be buried anywhere. It's gross. Okay, I'm going, yeah, <laughs> indeed, just what I said. Yeah, Wes said, bring a thumb full of ashes so it won't be noticeable. And they get arrested for littering. I don't know. John says, it's the last place in the world I want my ashes spread. Mm. Yeah, that's respectful of the person who died. I mean, I, I get the idea. I've never been happier than I was at Disneyland. So I want my ashes spread on the in the Pirates of the Caribbean water, right? Or something. I get the thought behind it, but people don't understand that what actually happens when you do that is a lot different, right? It is inconsiderate of everyone there. Oh my God. I have to tell you the most inconsiderate thing I, I saw yesterday. Um, and I'll take this. Let me take this picture off the screen while I tell you the story. This is This happened in Petaluma, where I live. Let's see. Uh oh, oh, there it is. And I took my daughter to Petaluma Market. And I 
parked and I was waiting for her and there was someone parked right in front of me. So we're eye to eye, right? Well, we're not eye to eye yet. She comes out of the store with her cart and she goes in the space in between the front of my car and the front of hers. She parks her cart and she takes out her bag and she puts her bag in her car and then she gets into her car. No, she doesn't take the cart back to the front of the store, which was only a few steps away. She leaves the cart there right between our two cars. And I'm thinking, really? You can't take the cart back to where you got it? First inconsiderate thing, number one. So I'm already like, how rude. Then she's digging around in her bag and she takes out something to eat and she's unwrapping things that are in paper. I think it was white paper. And she rolls down her window and she throws her white paper right out the window. I'm like, first of all, you can't take your cart back. You're littering. Like, what? So annoyed. I didn't Nikki Medoro it. I didn't say anything. Nikki would have gotten out of her car and been like, you pick up your stuff. I didn't say anything. But oh, man, people are so inconsiderate. They don't realize we're all sharing the space together. We're all sharing the planet. So clean up after yourself. Put your cart back. What are we, two? Come on. thought that was rude. Um, last story of the day. This is a story about sometimes when it seems like everything's going wrong, right? You're Maybe you're late. Maybe you didn't bring the right stuff. Your equipment's... Br- you end up on somewhere and your equipment's broken. Whatever you need was broken. This man, Richard Brock, he's been doing metal detecting for 35 years. And he he's drove three and a half hours from Somerset to Shropshire for a group dig on a farmland in the hills. When he arrived at the dig, he finds out his metal detecting kit isn't working. So he has to go to a backup model, which is an older faulty machine. He is an hour late to get all this together. But by the time he gets into it, 20 minutes in, he stri- strikes gold. He digs up this 64.8 gram gold nugget that was buried only about six inches underground. It's believed to be the biggest find of its kind on English soil. And they think it'll bring about 30,000 pounds at an auction which runs until April 1st. He said he thought he missed all the action this day. He said, I couldn't believe it. I turned up late. There was only a matter of minutes left in this dig. It was supposed to go all day, but for whatever reason, it didn't. And he makes this rare find. This area is believed to have been an old track with railway lines that could have contained stone from Wales, which is an area known to be rich in gold. And clearly, yes. He said it goes to show, doesn't really matter what equipment you use. If you're walking over the find and you're alert enough to what might be lurking underneath the soil, that's what makes all the difference. So his gold nugget weighs, what was it, 64 grams? 64.8 grams much bigger than the last one found, which was 54 grams. So his is now the biggest. Um, He said that research suggested bigger gold nuggets have been found in Wales and Scotland as well. There was one that weighed 97.12 grams, 12 grams found in Wales in 2016, and one that weighed 121 grams in Scotland in 2019. So I guess people go out on these digs looking for gold. Hey, probably have a better chance of finding that than you have of winning the mega millions or the super lotto or the powerball or whatever else all right i'm going to the chat uh, before we end the show Uh, murphy says i had a rude parker yesterday too i was trying to pull into an empty space a driver put her empty cart right in the middle of the parking spot then got in her car and just sat there it's like do you not know what's around you do you not see your environment or wonder you know what your impact on other people is rude 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 Mm. um about the gold looks like it had quartz in it i don't know it's supposed to be a gold nugget i'm not sure west says i rarely see a cart 
in the uh, Aldi parking lot. That's good. That's nice. And that's the way it usually is at Petaluma Market. So I don't know. Gordon is kind and picks up trash, especially plastic cups when I go walking. I see them every day. That's what I should have done, Gordon. I should have gotten out, but it's kind of confrontational. And I should have walked over and picked up her garbage and walked over to a garbage can, like to make a point. But I mean, is that as rude as her? I don't know. Um, oh, about ashes. Lori says my brother wanted to put some of my mom's ashes at Coney Island, took a very small sample and mixed with beach sand by the boardwalk, respected wishes without endangering anyone. Yeah. And then you do just a little bit, as Wes was saying as well, right? Mama says if you spread your ashes in your own yard, you can call it a can you call it a cemetery and not pay taxes? No, I think it's probably illegal, right? Because there are certain regulations for disposing of human remains, and I don't think you're supposed to be able to do it in your yard. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't know if it's laziness or just really not being aware. Maybe she really felt there was nothing wrong with it, just like the lady that was not self-aware in Murphy's situation. I don't know. Gordon wants his spread under a redwood tree. Yeah. Spending eternity with it's a small world washing over your remains seems like punishment. The only thing worse would be cars for kids. On this, we agree, James. Absolutely. Um, some people to thank this afternoon. Wes with a $5 super sticker. Really, really appreciate you. Uh, Luis with a $5 super sticker and uh, good wishes for the lotto. Yes, I will play and I will let you know how it works out. And Cindy, need to win the lottery to give more money. Woohoo! Cindy, thank you for that. All right, I'm going to buy my ticket today. You know who is in Petaluma today is Janet R. So I may end up hanging out with her for a little bit. I always love when you guys uh, contact me and if you're going to be in my area. Uh, oh, Wes says, I want to be cremated after that story about the brain sticking around just in case. You don't want anyone tampering with your soft tissue? Mm-hmm. Karen says, if we all picked up a piece of trash we see on the ground every day, there wouldn't be a trash problem. I always take a bag to the beach to clean up. Absolutely. Well done. Yeah. Uh, Murphy loves small world. So see, to each their own. I kind of like small world as well. All right, you guys. Thank you for being here. I will see you tomorrow on the Nikki Maduro show. Nikki is in. Uh, Mark Thompson is in. Mark's madness continues. And tomorrow, one of the best days of the week with David K. Johnston on the Mark Thompson show. So make sure to tune in. And then Travel Tuesday here on the After Party Live. Thank you for all the ways you contribute to the show. Appreciate it. Still working on getting the uh, the PayPal link up, the new PayPal link. So again, thank you very much for being here. I hope you have a great rest of your day. We're supposed to get ready in the Bay Area on Wednesday. So we've got, I think, a couple of dry days is what I've, I understand. So enjoy them. Make it a great day. And I will see you tomorrow. Uh, thank you again. The After Party Live would like to thank the following contributors and viewers like you.